What if I told you all the things we care about can be tied back to one simple question? Can you turn your lights on in the morning? Electricity is all around us, but we rarely notice it. It's something I think about every day. I'm a numbers guy. When I look at the world, I see stats and spreadsheets. My house is filled with electric stuff. I have my personal fire cooking device, a spiffy teapot, a dishwasher, toaster, an oven, and the ultimate gadget, the entirety of the world's information, and it fits in the palm of my hand. Nearly everything we touch, almost everything we read, eat, or wear has in one way or another been electrified. When I look at my refrigerator, I see a device that uses more electricity per year than roughly three billion people. Having electricity doesn't guarantee wealth, but not having it almost always means poverty. I'm Robert Bryce, and the way I see it, electricity explains the world. PG&E presents Ready, your tireless household servant. I wash and dry your clothes, play your radios, I can heat your coffee pot. I am always there with lots of power to spare, cause I'm ready, kill one. Remember, just plug in. I'm ready. You know, it's funny how we take things like electricity for granted. Electricity is different from every other form of energy because for the first time in history, we're controlling forces we can't see or feel. Thanks to the electric grid, we're harnessing the motion of zillions upon zillions of electrons, and we can unleash those electrons whenever and wherever we want. Hey, wait a minute, Jim, I need some facts. The National Academies of Engineering ranked the electric grid as the most important engineering innovation of the 20th century not just for a wealthy, privileged class, but for everyone. Promotional literature from the 30s and the 40s, it's all aimed at the woman of the household. Make your life easier with an electric washer, with an electric stove. Electricity has allowed people, and in particular, women and girls, to escape the drudgery of past eras. It has liberated them from the pump, the stove, and the wash tub. Electricity has changed how we communicate, how we travel, and where we live. Our nation was stirring with new ideas, new wants, new needs. Modern life and electricity are synonymous with one another. Your refrigerator, your lights, your microwave, those are all part of the grid. To realize how much our lives have changed in just two generations. It's amazing innovation. To me, it's like a co-creation with nature. Naturally, we got the sunlight, but rest of the time it is dark but you have co-created, so you have light 24 hours. Life has been on this planet for about four and a half billion years. Homo sapiens for maybe half a million years. Civilization only began 40,000 years ago. Humanity advanced through fire and the wheel and levers and building ships, very, very slowly advancing. Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. And there've really been two major revolutions that have increased the rate of the change. First was the Industrial Revolution with mechanics. Only 150 years ago, human civilization went under radical transformation. As grand as that was, that pales in comparison to the rate of change we've seen since the emergence of electricity. Archaeological records show that our hominid ancestors began using fire about one million years ago. Fire use became common some 400,000 years ago. By contrast, we have only been putting electricity to work since the 1880s. Therefore, if we could compress the 400,000 years that humans have been using fire into one 24-hour period, 
the electric age would span only the last 30 seconds before midnight. Now, the rate of change is so fast, it is very difficult for even those of us working within it or trying to track it and trying to plan it. We are constantly surprised by how much faster change happens than we can predict ourselves. If we're going to talk about electricity, we should probably start at the beginning. To do that, we went to the birthplace of the electric age. We're here in Lower Manhattan. It was in this region where Thomas Edison began the electric age with the first electric grid. And within a mile of where I'm standing right here in the battery was also the cradle of the skyscraper. For centuries, humans have built tall structures like the Statue of Liberty. But the electric age fundamentally changed the city. Just plug in. I'm ready. As the technology came into being, it behaved like every other technology. We had some successful entrepreneurs. They saw a market and they started out small. Edison, he wanted a demonstration plant where he's going to supply electric light to anyone who wants it. And he wanted to be near Wall Street because he felt he needed the bankers on his side. The first commercial power plant in the United States, the Pearl Street Station in New York City, reached out and served a small number of customers. Pearl Street does not make a profit. And Edison saw that if he were going to be successful, you need some way to distribute this over a large area. It's the only way to make it economical for the common user. Most of us have heard names like Edison, Tesla, and Westinghouse. They were key pioneers. But Frank Sprague changed the way we use juice. Before Sprague, electricity was used almost exclusively for lighting. His innovations forced electric companies to focus on providing power. Well, Frank Sprague was a graduate of the Naval Academy, and the Navy had the first electrical school. And when Sprague comes in to the Edison Company, he immediately starts seeing places for improvement. Edison doesn't see motors as something that's important. Sprague comes up with a motor. He needed something efficient. He needed something compact. He needed something that was economically viable. And he delivered on all three. He gets Edison's approval. The Pearl Street plant becomes profitable for the first time. And that changes the future of electric power because the early companies are all called lighting companies. You go 10 years in the future, they're all power and light companies. The power customer becomes the most important customer, not the light customer. In 1894, Frank Sprague completed the first bank of electric elevators inside the Postal Telegraph Building at 253 Broadway. Powered by Sprague's compact electric motors, those elevators were faster, cheaper, and cleaner than ever before. Frank Sprague, because of the project that the Postal Telegraph Building at 250 Broadway really casts the mold for all future skyscrapers, large urban buildings. Of course, you go in any large building anywhere in the world today, you've got banked elevators, but this is sort of a new idea. Basically, height is electrical. From the time of the caves, 30 or 40,000 years ago, Humanity was essentially flat. Cities, on the one hand, are old. Uh, Rome, 2,000 years ago, had a million people. But essentially, cities remained the same for hundreds, thousands of years. And then electricity came along, and suddenly cities could become three-dimensional. The urge to go skyward that you saw in New York through the whole 20th century was a manifestation of the tremendous amount of concentrated energy. If you look at the greatest buildings of the Middle Ages, the cathedrals, they were small by modern standards. In the history of architecture, there were symbolic structures which use height in order to signify their importance, their spirituality. But New York, a kind of capital of capitalism, found in the skyscraper a way to exploit the demand for central locations in cities and the ability to use the elevator in order to go above the normal height that people feel comfortable to walk upstairs, which is about five or six stories. The ability to rise in space, even 100 feet or 200 feet, which doesn't seem like much, completely transformed the structure, the geography, the geometry of cities. It made possible office buildings in which you could have hundreds, thousands of people working for the same firm. It's hundreds of relays that transmit 10,000 electrical impulses to motivate the cars. Once you have a tall building, if you look down from space, you can calculate the watts per square meter that that building consumes. The spatial density of the consumption in a city like New York is extremely high. 
And here's the deal. Vertical cities reduce the human footprint on the natural world. Small footprints are good. Density, whether it involves energy production, food production, or urban living, is green. The process of human progress is also a process of environmental progress and that it's comprised centrally of energy transitions from energy diffuse fuels to energy dense ones with electricity being the most important ultimate carrier of energy for modern societies. Energy is often referred to as the master resource. Electricity is the master of the master resources. Without electricity, you are effectively going back in time to a world that we have been able to innovate away from. You know, there was a point when we were relying heavily on you know, wood and dung and also horse and carriages in cities. And cities just after a while became unlivable. You have to understand the energy ladder. There's a broad pattern for how people become prosperous, but also how we protect the natural environment. Cities, from my point of view, as a green, as an environmentalist, are the salvation of nature. It's only by concentrating a significant portion of humanity in livable, attractive cities that we have the chance to spare the rest of nature for the lions and the tigers and the eagles. We know that there are about 1.2 billion people in the world today who have no access to electricity at all. What's missing in that statistic is that there are a couple of billion more whose access to electricity is inadequate, intermittent. The system doesn't work all the time. The defining inequality in the world today is the disparity between the electricity rich and the electricity poor. What does that mean? Let's go back to my refrigerator. It uses about 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. By my count, there are about 3 billion people today who on an individual basis use less electricity than my fridge. India, a country as ancient as it is modern, moving as history moves across the threshold of the past. About a third of all Indians live in poverty, and about 300 million of them, a population nearly the size of the United States, don't have access to any electricity at all. When electricity isn't readily available, people will do whatever it takes to get it, and that includes theft. People are using wires to put a hook in the wires and draw the electricity. That is unmetered supply. That is theft. In central Calcutta, where hooking is going on, TNC losses, technical and commercial losses. We have around 11.5%, where the national average is around 40, 45, 50. It's as high as that. If I can interrupt you and have you repeat that, because these numbers kind of stagger the mind. We, our, our loss figures, TNC losses, technical and commercial losses total, it's around 11.5%, whereas the national average is around 40%, 40. It's a staggering number. That's a staggering loss. Uh -huh. <laughs> So if you look above me here to the right, there's some hooks on the electric line, which is uh, common, but the locals don't want to talk about. In the rural area, it's very common because there's a low tension line is there. So the people easily hook the electricity for the domestic purpose. It's one of the conundrums of electricity service. To make electricity available to everyone, it has to be cheap. But it can't be cheap when the system lacks integrity. Whether it's customers stealing from the utility or the utility ripping off customers, integrity is as important to the grid as engineering. You can have food and not have a modern life. There are plenty of people who don't have electricity and have food, but whose standard of living is really not up to what we would think of as a modern standard of living. This is a biomass stove. This is rice straw, gold patty, and then they feed it into the bottom of the, yeah. the, the pit here and then put the pots on the top. So this is uh, 
just a traditional method of cooking. There can be direct correlation found between those people who are using the conventional biomass for their cooking and their health. And what happens that cooking is done by the woman and that woman actually inhales all the pollutant during cooking. Cooking in that environment for four to five hours has a serious health impact. Every year in India, more than one million people die from indoor air pollution. The use of biomass in cooking causes horrifying damage to human health, especially to that of women and girls. University of California Berkeley professor Kirk Smith estimates the health impact of cooking with biomass is akin to burning 400 cigarettes an hour in your kitchen. Women take up the brunt of domestic work, and in the absence of electricity, that domestic work is more difficult, more time consuming, less productive, and it's women and girls who deal with it. The mothers are spending all day long just doing the basic household chores. Women and girls are sort of the managers of household energy. The way they get that is labor intensive. Women spend a lot of time fetching firewood because there's no energy for actual light. It's, you know, collecting wood, collecting dung, collecting water. You don't have a fridge. So you have to cook every evening. Kitchens are five degrees warmer when you are cooking there. Suppose the temperature outside is 35 degrees. So your kitchen is 40 degrees. You need air conditioning. Oftentimes people talk about energy poverty in very abstract terms without thinking about, okay, what do we want this energy to achieve once people have it? When you're able to transform your economy from just being based off of raw materials, you put women on the path to participate in an economy that is richer, in an economy that is more just for women and girls. And in India, sun is down by 6, 6.30 max in the summer. Your time becomes short and it's all dark. You can't see anything. This is an old style kerosene lamp. This is the centuries old now version of what we use. And we use LED lights, incandescence, fluorescence. But in villages like this one, this is what they use here. If you are absorbed in the dark, darkness absorbs you too. So you do not see the light and you cannot bring the light to others. Electricity has allowed us to conquer our oldest foe, darkness. For millennia, the cost of having well-lit spaces at night was so high that only the very rich could afford it. Those well-lit spaces matter more than you think. A few months before our visit, an elephant invaded the tiny village of Chargora. Turns out, well-lit spaces help keep unwanted guests out of the village. When the lights are out and you live in rural West Bengal, you risk getting trampled by roaming elephants. Like my friend Joya Shri, I had a moment in which I finally understood what darkness means. In the small agricultural settlement of Majlishpukur, located southeast of Kolkata, I met Rehena Jamadar. So, Rehena, can you tell me how your life is different? With electricity versus before. Right? She's saying that there is still much to happen. Sure. But at least some help is happening. So in the home, they have entertainment system and they have the grinding system. So these are helping them. But also, your children can read at, at night. It made up the girl goes to the college. But but could she go to college if she couldn't read at night? No. Straight answer is no. If you had electricity when you were small, could you have gone to university? Yes, she would have gone. Darkness had kept this gracious and intelligent woman from achieving something that she knew was within her grasp. Here was a person who, had she been born in one of India's cities instead of Majlish Pukur, would have gone to college. With a college education, she could have been a doctor, a lawyer, or maybe a nurse or engineer. By the time I met Rehenna, I knew plenty of facts and statistics. The average resident of India uses about 800 kilowatt hours of electricity per year, which is about a quarter of the global average. I understood the myriad correlations between electricity availability and health and wealth. 
But that 15-minute conversation with Rahana and Joya Shri made me see the light. Darkness kills human potential. Electricity nourishes it. My first memory of a blackout in Accra, they used to happen quite often. We grew up in a place in the mountains, and it was normal to us that we're going to have some yellow electricity and some white electricity. And I remember I was in the first grade, I was six, and there was going to be a pop quiz the next morning. In our house, we used to have the yellow lights on, and this indicates that this electricity is being supplied by the EDL. So I go home, and I'm studying, I'm really excited, but also very nervous. And in the middle of my study session, the power goes off. And I began crying consolably because there's no way I'm going to finish memorizing this times table where there's no power. And then every six hours, the lights will go off, and then we will turn on the UPS. So we used to communicate with my, with my father, tell him that I need to study now for the school. Shall I study when the yellow lights are on or when the white lights are on? So the white lights, we use them using the UPS, the fluorescent lamp. And uh, my mother got a kerosene lantern, lit it up for me, and sat by me while I studied my times table. And I think that was my first recollection of just how important that basic infrastructure is. So to us, this was normal. It was like we lived with it, that we're going to be having two different types of power, and sometimes we're not going to be having power. This was normal to us. We didn't know that actually people get 100% electricity. You know, we have this classic image of someone in a poor village who finally has light getting an education. Let's say there's a solar panel on the roof. It's brought light. And in the evening now, they can, they can be safe and they can study. And then the kid turns 16 and they've got an education. What are they going to do? Is our expectation that the, the extent of their ambition is to remain a subsistence farmer with an education? I don't think so. They're going to want a job. They're going to want to do something clever. They're going to want to become a better farmer, maybe an agronomic scientist. When we top out our energy expectations for the developing world, all we're really saying is we expect that you can have enough energy to stay poor in a little more comfort, maybe. And maybe to be educated enough to know that you are poor. Incrementalism is good, but it's dangerous when we view it as the only paradigm. What makes you think that an African's need for power is inferior to an American's need for power? I think that rest of the world who is enjoying modernity and we are not allowing others to be modern is a crime. It's a major crime. Mutual respect for the humanity of people who live in other continents, that should guide global energy policy discussions. Today, billions of people are living in conditions like those in rural India and sub-Saharan Africa. Collectively, those billions make up the low-watt world, those with intermittent or insufficient access to electricity. In 1989, less than 20% of the country had access to electricity. It was a military government that had come in power through a coup d'etat, and the government decided that by the year 2020, everyone in this country will have power. Ghana transitioned into democratic rule in 92, and every government that has come since then has stayed on the promise of universal electricity access. So now in 2017, access is at 83% in Ghana. To date, whenever Ghana is about to have elections, you see a lot of infrastructure projects going up and down all over the country. So in this case, democracy has really been the tool that has propelled the electrification project. Keeping the electricity flowing day after day, year after year, requires constant infusions of cash that is then used to buy fuel, repair wires, and replace poles. Electricity systems have to pay for themselves. If there's any kind of leakage, like theft or corruption, the system fails. In the year 2050, most of the world's population will live in Africa or will be African. How are we going to have a population, all these bright young minds, if they are not plugged in? What is going to be their function? It's a huge demographic crisis staring us in the face. I think that one of the first things to do now to ensure that by 2050, the young Africans on the continent and around the world are people who are productive, self-reliant, empowered, people who will be free from poverty, we have to plug them in now. It begins now. While scores of low-watt countries around the globe struggle to bring their people out of the dark and into the light, 
the U.S. enjoys an almost embarrassment of riches. Electricity abounds, so much so that the high-watt world keeps stumbling into new ways of using massive amounts of juice. Take me back to sea level. <sighs> Electricity does, in fact, explain the world. That's why I'm here in Boulder, Colorado, arguably the world capital of legal weed cultivation and retailing. Within about five miles of where I'm standing here in Chautauqua Park, there are about a dozen and a half legal weed dispensaries selling brands like Purple Haze. But to produce Purple Haze and other brands of cannabis sativa, they are using lots of electricity. In fact, marijuana cultivation is the world's single most electricity-intensive agricultural business. All over this town, entrepreneurs are busy turning watts into weed. We're, we're looking for a dispensary. It's not that hard to find them, but there are about 20 of them in the city, or at least a dozen and a half of them. But yeah, we're bagging dispensaries so to speak. Uh, all these buildings, they'll have big signs on them, but the grow operations don't have any signs and they usually only have the street number. You just look at the exterior of the building, no signs, and look at the long electrical conduit lines that are on the outside. Look at the size of the three-phase conduit going into that gray box and then how many meters they've got right behind it. That's all new conduit on the outside of the building. Why else would you need that much electricity in such a nondescript warehouse? Look at this, this is all brand new. This is new electrical service, 500 kilovolt amps. That's a brand new transformer put in just for a marijuana grow operation in this, in this warehouse. Marijuana growers don't want people to know they're growing marijuana, but know what to look for, they can find them. It's certainly keeping the energy company busy, upgrading transformers, all sorts of equipment upgrades like that that are needed for high energy use facilities. Electricity use by the cannabis industry has been increasing sharply over the past several years. I believe the average has been about 34% per year. The electricity intensity of marijuana cultivation is 23 times that of a hospital and about 130 times that of an average US residence. That's a lot of juice. Want to know the real buzzkill? About half of Colorado's electricity comes from coal-fired power plants. As a result, boulder dispensaries are required by city ordinance to prove they're growing polar bear-friendly ganja. Colorado's had a number of different mandates and opportunities for using renewable technologies. So for example, I live in Boulder. I get my, my electricity from Xcel Energy. I can pay a little bit more to have that energy come from wind power. It's important for a lot of people because of politics and wealth to be able to feel like you're doing something environmental while you're living like everyone else does. It has not led to an appreciable decarbonization of the Colorado economy. A lot of the offsetting provisions, whether it's for the cannabis industry, for individual homeowners, it's simply accounting. The number that really matters is where does the energy come from? And as so long as Colorado gets 85% of its energy from fossil fuels, 85% of the economic activity in Colorado is from fossil fuels, no matter which we assign to the 15% and which we assign to the 85%. We're going to a black market grower in Denver. He has decided that it's far easier to operate in the black market and more profitable to do it in the black market than in the regulated market. Okay. My name is Daniel. I'm currently driving an Uber and I also grow marijuana. 
I was arrested for growing marijuana in 2003, and I received a felony conviction for that. As a result of that, I'm not allowed to participate in the legitimate marijuana industry. If you were going to tell me what are the three key things you need to know to set up a clandestine operation. You have to have buyers for your product. You need to have good knowledge of botany, and you need to have a good knowledge of setting up an electrical system that will support an operation like that. What about stealing electricity? What, what about that? That's something I would never do because if you are caught doing that, you're probably going to be in more trouble for stealing the electricity than you are going to be in trouble for growing the weed. They have ways of detecting leakage in electricity, and they do that by scanning each part of the grid periodically. That could bring down the operation in itself. In 2013, indoor pot farms in Denver were consuming about 100 gigawatt hours of electricity. By 2016, that figure had almost tripled to about 275 gigawatt hours. To put that in perspective, businesses in Denver are using nearly as much electricity just to grow weed as what's consumed by the entire country of Burundi. Colorado, which had a 2020 target for renewable energy and emissions reduction, now has a 2025 target. So we've moved our targets off into the future because we're not hitting them. Right now we're working towards a long-term goal, a very significant goal of 80% reduction in emissions by 2050. Obviously, if the emissions from this industry continue to increase exponentially, that could have a major impact. But right now, we don't think that it is going to cause us to be derailed from our goal. To be sure, it's easy to snicker at the amount of electricity needed to grow marijuana. But the fact that people in rich countries are using electricity to grow cannabis, while people in poor ones are stealing it solely to survive, provides a stark reminder of the vast disparity between the people who live high-watt lives and those who live mostly in the dark. Para una isla como Puerto Rico, todo, salud, comercio, estabilidad, proyección al mundo. Aquí personas han perdido la vida por la falta de electricidad. En los pueblos del centro de la isla, en los pueblos del este de la isla, Humacao, Patillas, Yabucoa, Las Piedras, Orocovis, Comerío, Jayuya, hay gente que está muriendo porque no tienen acceso a servicios de energía eléctrica porque dependen para su salud del servicio de energía eléctrica. Así que la energía eléctrica para los puertorriqueños significa vida. Keep, keep going. So this is, this is normal now, for... Now you have the problem that we have here in Puerto Rico. So please keep going, if you don't mind, because uh, we'll just ignore the lights for now and just keep going. Yeah, let's put the batteries on the LEDs. We just had a blackout. This could be for an hour, two hours, could be the rest of yeah. the day. Uh, probably two hours. Two hours. Yeah.
So right now we're stuck in traffic and in the middle of a, a blackout in Puerto Rico and obviously the lights aren't working because the electricity is out. So you have all these cars trying to merge through the intersection and it's kind of a, a little game of chicken about who's going to stop and who's going to play and right now I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here's the good part. We're heading right over there to see the power plant that is owned by Prepa that is not working because no one knows exactly why. Going in this way. Yeah, private property bus. Hi, we're doing a documentary on the corruption. Well, <laughs> yeah, you might have heard. Hello. This is Robert Bryce. Let's, People like him a lot. Let's not push it. I'm standing on the Bay of San Juan. Puerto Rico now has the distinction of having the longest blackout in American history. And today, April 18th, 2018, that blackout record is getting even longer. In fact, the entire island of Puerto Rico today is in blackout. And this power plant behind me, the Palo Seco power station, rated at 600 megawatts, appears to be producing no electricity at all. Gracias por esto. Y por favor, su nombre y... Arnaldo Castellano. Nosotros trabajamos sirviendo comida de marisco, eh, comida criolla aquí en, en Puerto Rico, en el área de Palo Seco. El generador eh, se llena con el tanque de diésel con 1.200 dólares. Y la luz casi siempre viene de 1.200 a 1.300 dólares. ¿Lo mismo? Lo mismo. Si no hay electricidad, no hay cerveza fría. <risa> es, es importante, ¿no? Es importante. Sí. sí, claro. Una cerveza no se la pueden tomar caliente. There's still 300,000 people that don't have power. We are U.S. citizens, and we do deserve to have the same level of support that any U.S. citizen has anywhere in the world. There is no production without electricity. I mean, there is no economic movement without access to power. My name is Miguel Colón. I'm the vice president of Modelosa Printing. We do mostly printing for our manufacturing industry in Puerto Rico. The business has been in the family since the last 30 years. Right after the hurricane, it was like a war zone. Passage through the roads was difficult because there was a lot of trees on the roads. A lot of power posts were on the floor. It was a total devastation. Inside the business, there was a lot of water, a lot of equipment damaged by the water. Our solar infrastructure was gone. It was messy. We were without electrical power for about three months. We are still operating without AC in, on the whole plant. And before the hurricane, we were paying about $30,000 per month on electricity. I pay more for electricity than I do for payroll. I understand time, I understand we're an island, I understand it takes time to get things here, but does it take seven months? Is there really a plan? Some people still don't have water. Poder en Santo La Loma significa no tener electricidad y no tener agua potable. Dependemos de bombas eléctricas para poder tener agua. Y no solamente nosotros, nuestras casas, sino el barrio entero. No sube el agua, es así el mayor resto y la mayor dificultad. I cannot envision or imagine living without access to power. It's like water, it's a necessity. Estuvimos 105 días sin agua, en los cuales tuvimos que buscar aguas en oasis. Ya tenemos por lo menos agua, pero no tenemos energía eléctrica. Ya la, el tiempo es eh, a disposición de la luz del sol, lo que se puede hacer. Y si uno no tiene planta, peor. No puede entonces hacer nada por la noche. Sí, el drone. Gracias, Iris. Por, por favor, ¿cómo se llama 
Bueno, mi nombre es Iris Ortiz Pérez, yo vivo en el barrio Antón Ruiz. Bueno, antes nosotros lo veíamos como algo dado, ¿verdad? Porque, pues, yo lo único que hacía es prender la luz y ya sigues caminando. Nosotros hemos regresado quizás a la época de mi abuela. Para mis papás también ha sido bien difícil este, el no tener la luz, la energía eléctrica, porque no pueden ver televisión. Ellos le ha dado mucha depresión y le ha dado este, ansiedad. Le ha aumentado el Alzheimer's a ellos. El apagaban la ropa, o se hace uno imposible porque hay que estarla lavando a mano por, por la falta de luz. Entonces hay que estar cocinando con, con gas y pedacitos de leña y esas cositas. While visiting with Iris Ortiz and her family, she shared a story about how one of her daughters wanted to have her hair done for school pictures. She was distraught. How could she use a hair dryer without electricity? How would she iron her clothes without electricity? The luxuries we so often take for granted on the mainland had disappeared. Their world had been turned upside down. They were now living low watt lives and they're American citizens. The grid looked like it was being held up by clothespins. Irma comes and it was our sparring partner. And obviously the grid suffered damage there. And some of the resources were used. And two weeks later, we get the knockout punch. So the clothespins were all over the island and everything just fell apart. There was a lot of competition for resources. FEMA came very quickly, but it took control of all the resources. There was no gas for the whole population. The gas was for the military and for FEMA. Drinking water supply was reserved for the military and for FEMA. Hubo mucha descoordinación y no hubo una planificación estratégica para tener, atender la respuesta. Eh, yo no he visto ningún poste cambiado, no he visto ningún transformador. Nosotros estamos como olvidados. Realmente esta área está como olvidada, como si como si nosotros no existiéramos. How long do you think New Yorkers would accept being without power? A day, a week, a month? Before you would have massive demonstrations? There's people here that today still don't have power. Seven months after the hurricane. It is unacceptable. Two months after our trip to Puerto Rico, Iris Ortiz sent me an email. One minute ago, we got electricity to our neighborhood, she wrote in Spanish. Gracias por sus oraciones. Dios les bendiga mucho. Thank you for your prayers. God bless you very much. I replied, touched that she'd shared her family's story with someone who was a stranger only two months prior. Estás volviendo al mundo moderno, I wrote. You're going back to the modern world. We're here in Iceland at Gullfoss Falls. As you can see, this country has enormous hydropower potential. About 75% of the electricity here comes from hydro. The other 25% comes from geothermal. 
This abundant electricity is attracting industries from all over the world, and in particular, data centers and cryptocurrency miners. Yeah, the Pirate Party said, just come in, they'll let you in. You'll find the security situation is not anything like what's on Capitol Hill. This is your left, on our strike it sure looks way too small to be the Parliament House. There are only 330,000 people in this. No, I got it. But even still, more than a third of Iceland's citizens live in Reykjavik, the country's spotless capital city. It's politically stable and has been for centuries. In fact, Iceland's parliament, the Althing, was founded in 930, making it one of the world's oldest parliaments. Among the newest political parties in Iceland is the Pirate Party, which views itself as something of a Robin Hood of politics. The Pirate Party was created to make sure that uh, Iceland would become a safe haven for freedom of information, expression, and uh, privacy. They want transparency, taking the power from the powerful and giving it to the powerless. I created the Pirate Party to make sure that these laws would be written and implemented. And Iceland could resurrect as a Switzerland of bits, a digital safe haven where you could host, among other things, all the forbidden knowledge in our world. This vision is responsible for a lot of the data centers in Iceland. Um, electricity and money are becoming the same thing. The transfer of money is the transfer of information. Money is constantly becoming more and more electrified. When you have cheap electricity available, you can turn it into money. That's why we need stable electricity, stable power supply, reliable partners like we have here in Iceland. We are seeing cryptocurrency disrupt the financial industry, or at least gaining a lot of traction. Banks have, for many years, been trading currency only electronically. When you store your money in the bank, they don't have a vault with cash in it. They just have a digital register themselves. One of the reasons I became fascinated with cryptocurrency was I heard a story about migrant workers who could move money back to their families without Western Union chipping in a big chunk of that. I also became fascinated by it because I don't want somebody to have access to every transaction I make. I don't care if I make normal transactions. I just don't want anybody to know exactly everything I do. We have to develop ways to regain our privacy, and cryptocurrencies is certainly one way to do that. Iceland has some of the strictest privacy laws in the world, and when you consider their views on privacy, along with a cool climate and cheap, abundant electricity, it makes perfect sense that Iceland has become a hotbed of cryptocurrency production. This is an industry that relies on high density with their infrastructure that is consuming a lot of energy. Here in Iceland, we have free air cooling. We can rely on the cool air outside to cool down the servers in our data centers. The electricity intensity will definitely increase because it takes more hash power to mine one Bitcoin. The more Bitcoins are mined, the more difficult it gets to mine one Bitcoin. There are studies and predictions that say that the Bitcoin network is going to consume as much power as Denmark in 2020. The deployed power behind that is massive. So you've been your whole career with HS Orca then? Not the whole career, no. I've been here for a, around or with HS Orca for almost 10 years. I see. In terms of electricity, then, for all the geothermal in Iceland, about how much is produced here? We are producing, in total, 175 megawatts. Iceland has gone from undeveloped to developed. I've also been to Africa, to Ethiopia, where, where they have very unstable electricity, and you could see it where we were 50 years ago. So it's really only 50 years that Iceland's gone from completely dependent on cod and yeah. diesel fuel to one now where your electricity is all renewable yeah. and you're attracting industry from all over the world. Yeah. It's a simple question. What does electricity mean? Technology. 
technology, innovation, and higher standards for living people. The evolution of Iceland's economy was due, in large part, to its ability to tap into its natural resources, like geothermal and hydroelectric power. Just 50 years ago, the country's main export was cod. Today, Iceland has the world's highest per capita electricity consumption, over 53,000 kilowatt hours per year. And its main exports are things made with electricity. For us to survive, much less thrive as humanity, we have got to dramatically step up the energy availability and the cleanliness of that energy. Wars are fought over profound disparities in access to natural resources and access to information, and almost all that goes back to the availability of cheap and plentiful electricity. Began, history today is made anew in lands at once timeless and changing, fabled and mysterious, yet as sharply real as a headline, the lands of the Middle East. It's going to take 10 to 15 minutes to be in the hotel. Thank you. Oh, very well. Where are you coming from? Texas. Texas, America. <laughs> I'm American, guys. I'm from Michigan. No kidding. <laughs> I swear to God. I've wanted to come here my whole life. I've, I've, I've heard about Beirut my whole life. Enjoy it then, enjoy it. You can really enjoy it. Before 1975, the state of electric utility in Lebanon was so good that they were selling electricity to Syria. We didn't have any shortage, we didn't have any problem with the quality. But during the war, things started deteriorating. Stuck in the world's toughest neighborhood, Lebanon was once the crown jewel of the region. Its capital, Beirut, was called the Paris of the Middle East. But a 15-year civil war coupled with constant skirmishes with its neighbors has left ordinary Lebanese living low-watt lives. They were bombing roads, they were bombing power plants, so they were trying to break the infrastructure of the country, break the Lebanese economy to try to somehow make Lebanese give up on their government. Destroying electric infrastructure is a staple of modern warfare. The US military bombed power plants in North Korea, in North Vietnam, and in Iraq. Knocking out electricity supplies is considered a strategic move, like destroying bridges or roads. The Israelis were in conflict with Hezbollah, and they actually wanted to penalize the Lebanese people because Hezbollah was and has been, and I think will continue to be part of the Lebanese government. They are represented in the parliament, they are represented in the cabinet of ministers. You have certain factions in this nation that do not care about the progression of the life of the ordinary Lebanese citizen. We lost a lot of uh, infrastructure and we haven't recovered yet. Why haven't we recovered? I think because we had a lack of political will. The one reason in Lebanon that we do not have electricity is corruption, plain and simple. In Lebanon, uh, you need to uh, schedule your life depending on electricity. You schedule your shower, you schedule your uh, washing machine, your washing time. You schedule everything depending on electricity in our daily lives. You pay two electric bills? As all Lebanese people, we pay two power electric bills. We pay one power electric bill to EDL, and you pay like the double of that to the private generators in general. Let's be frank with this. So the average Lebanese, they need electricity. They need power. They don't need to live in the dark. So they don't care where this comes from. We can't live without electricity for 12 hours a day. So we have to rely on private generators or, or diesel generators, and we can't all afford it. So the idea of having what we call a neighborhood generator evolved. Like every powerful person in the neighborhood will buy a private generator, produce electricity, and sell electricity to the neighborhood. That's what we call the generator mafia. You know this term, uh, the generator mafia? 100%. A hundred percent. Everybody knows about generator mafia. Oh, yes. It's the mafia. They don't want to 
to fix the electrical. They don't because, want the grid to work. Exactly. Because, you know, if they do the work and they give it to us 24 hours, those mafia is going to close. Yeah. They're not going to make money. And this business is a, very, is a very big business. and It's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't think they would be happy if this business stops. Look, I am a positive person. I don't like to call these mafias. I, I would say these are companies or businessmen that were created by necessity. If the national utility was supplying electricity reliably 24 hours, this wouldn't have existed. I live, my parents live in a village, and I know without those generators, life would have been much, much more difficult. They need the money. They're taking the money from the people just to put it in, his, in their pocket. Government, first is the government. I'm talking about the government in Lebanon. The mafia with the government. The mafia with the government. EDL produces at around 20 to 25 cents per kilowatt hour, and they are selling at around 10 to 11 cents. So the more they generate, the more they lose. At a time, the private generators, they generate at around 20 cents, and they sell at around 27 cents. So the more they generate, the more they make profit. So if you look at this very simple equation, you would immediately conclude that EDL would lose money by producing electricity, whereas the private generators would, would make money by producing electricity. So, uh, Throughout our travels in Lebanon, I asked people what they thought of the generator mafia. The best answer, by far, came from an advisor to the energy minister. He paused for a moment and then replied, dead serious, well, they're not all mafia. We're here in Juni, Lebanon, just north of Beirut. My right over here is the old power plant. You can see the big fuel tanks and the old smokestacks. It's not operating right now. But if you look over here, that's one of the Turkish power ships. Why are they leasing these power plants from the Turks? Because the power grid here in Lebanon is so fragile, they can't meet demand with the power generation stations that they have. So they're leasing them from the Turks. And what happens if they don't pay the bill? The Turks just take the power ship and sail back to Turkey. My name is Mustafa Balbaki. I'm 30 years old, software engineer, living in Beirut, Lebanon. So the cool feature of my app Beirut Electricity is that it provides you push notifications 10 minutes ahead of time when the electricity will be off, so that you can maybe grab that elevator or just save your work before shutting down your computer. I'm not fixing the electricity issue here in Lebanon. I'm just trying to help people to cope with it. I returned to Lebanon in 2011 after a long career in energy, and I brought with me a coffee machine that I had purchased in Canada. And I love that machine because I'm used to it. it, it, it it's fantastic. It grinds you fresh beans at exactly at the time where it's brewing the coffee, and you can program it to wake you up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And when I plugged it in Lebanon, it woke me up at 10, and I realized I had a power cut of three hours the same night. My wife that uh, actually I met in Canada she said, look, either you solve this problem or I'm going back. So I had to fix it. Still going backwards. Hey, E24, rock on. The reason we are in Lebanon is because it's a great lab. The first problem is environment. We are breathing our own fumes. The second issue is I know households who are paying $800 for their mortgage and another $700 or $800 for the electricity. It is overall a catastrophe on both economical and environmental aspects. The tendency today is for consumers to buy more iPhones, more laptops, more ACs, more equipment in general. All of those require electricity. The infrastructure that every country on the planet has is basically fixed and it takes time. And the larger the country, the more time it takes to upgrade that infrastructure. Microgrids are the future. In spite of Lebanon's many challenges, corruption, war, and a reliance on diesel generators that are both expensive and dirty, along came E24. 
Theirs was a twofold solution. One part solar, Lebanon has plenty of sunshine, and the other part storage. At a resort called Kirzai, E24 is using lead acid batteries designed in Bulgaria and manufactured in India to store electricity produced by panels made in China. It's a true microgrid, unplugged from EDL and beyond the reach of the generator mafia. There's a lot of different sources of clean energy. We need to be pursuing all of them. There is an idea that wouldn't it be great if we could get electricity for free, free in terms of its cost, free in terms of its environmental impacts. The idea of renewable energy meets that need for some people because there's sunshine, there's wind. We don't have to dirty the world to get that. The idea that we can power the world on 100% renewables, particularly wind and solar, is powerful because it's sort of pure and simple. It's sort of wholesome, like your grandma's energy. People see, you know, solar panels on a roof and that feels good to them. We have to focus on cost, reliability, and environmental attributes. We can't develop a system for decarbonization that doesn't accomplish those goals. Why do we care about climate change? It's not because we care about the number, the atmospheric CO2. It's because we're trying to protect ourselves and protect the world we have around us from the impact of climate change. So why in the name of doing that would you flood a river forest? Why would you cover the landscape with wind turbines? Why would you take sensitive desert area for solar? If those were the values that we were seeking to protect by the low carbon system, why would we go and interfere with those values in the name of bringing down carbon? One of the defining characteristics of debate over energy and climate is it's vitriolic, it's nasty. Uh, people have very strong views. They also have very strong beliefs that their views are the right ones. We want to have broad access to a wide variety of energy sources that meet the needs of modern life for as much of the world's population as we can achieve, cheaply, reliably, and with attention paid to the environmental impacts of producing that power. That's the goal. Should renewables be a part of that solution? I think the answer is yes. And then people start talking about things like, OK, well, maybe instead of expanding the grid, maybe we should give people solar lamps. No, it doesn't work that way. People are not going to eat solar lamps. People are not going to be transformed by solar lamps. I think the idea that we can move the entire economy to a set of renewable energy resources, it's really framing the objective in the wrong way because it makes renewables the objective. It turns the means into the end itself. By creating this brand renewable, which has put in the same basket, a massive hydroelectric dam, a wind turbine, and a solar PV panel. They're remarkably different ways of getting energy each with respective advantages and disadvantages. It's the opposite of what we actually want in the system we're trying to provide. We're not trying to create something chaotic. We're trying to create something stable, predictable, that can give people what they want, when they want it, at a low cost, every hour of the year. Preferably, you wouldn't do that with something that was driven by the weather. If you care about the natural environment, you're not going to create a power plant that requires 150 times more land per unit of energy than a nuclear plant. Nuclear power was 50, 60 years ago thought of as our energy future. It was going to provide energy that was too cheap to meter, that, that everyone would have, have free energy. Nuclear power became perceived as risky, and high profile events like Chernobyl, Fukushima have contributed to that public perception. May I say something? Go ahead. The energy in the atom is the most destructive force the world has ever seen can also be one of the greatest blessings God has ever given us. Which is it to be? When people consider environmental protection, nuclear energy is likely one of the last things to come to mind. It seems divorced from nature. I understand that sentiment. The first article I ever published was an anti-nuclear piece. I was in high school, and like many people from that era, I associated anything having to do with nuclear with the war effort and the military. Fear of nuclear, and especially from environmental organizations, is really a long-standing tradition. Most of these environmental organizations really came out of anti-war organizations. They benefited a lot from conflating nuclear power with nuclear weapons. You know, early nuclear designs did come out of the military, so I think there's that association for people who don't like that big military-industrial complex. So where are we going, Robert? We're at the Indian Point Energy Center in the village of Buchanan, New York. This is the largest nuclear plant in the state of New York.
Today I'm at the Indian Point Energy Center, located about 40 miles north of New York City. This plant has been operating since 1962, and today it produces about 25% of all the electricity consumed in the city of New York. These two reactors behind me produce more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity. The amazing thing about this plant is that it sits on about one square kilometer of land. As uranium atoms in the nuclear reactor disintegrate, tremendous amounts of heat are generated. When the heat is transferred to a liquid, and the liquid is circulated from the reactor to a boiler room, it can produce steam. Steam drives a generator to produce electricity. Getting into Indian Point wasn't easy. We went through multiple security checkpoints and multiple ID checks. But once inside, I was, as the Brits like to say, gobsmacked. I've seen oil fields, coal mines, gas plants, hydro plants, refineries, and all kinds of factories. But Indian Point was an engineering marvel, a relic from another era. Indian Point covers one square kilometer. Replacing its output with wind energy would require covering more than 1,300 square kilometers with wind turbines. That's one and a half times the size of New York City. This pad will hold about 75 years worth of nuclear fuel. Of spent fuel. Of spent fuel. So in eight decades of reactor years, right? Right. You can fit all the waste from all of that in this area, which, I don't know, a couple of tennis courts maybe? The likelihood of somebody coming along and carrying one of these off is? It's impossible. East cast weighs about 230,000 pounds when loaded. You can see our equipment that moves it. It moves at about one mile an hour. It's, you know, a tank, basically. So the original plan was for the federal government to come in and take that fuel off the hands of the utilities. And when the utilities realized that that, that wasn't going to happen, they basically invented dry cast storage so they could safely store it on site, which is really a, a political issue about what to do with it long term. Indian Point is suffering a fate similar to that of many nuclear facilities throughout the U.S. Premature closure. Since 2013, U.S. utilities have closed or announced the closure of 15 nuclear power plants. In many cases, those reactors, including the ones at Indian Point, could have obtained license extensions that would have allowed them to continue operating for decades into the future. So we've been known for many years as the smallest municipality with nuclear power plants in it. And there's generations of people who have worked at that plant, continue to work at that plant. Entergy is the largest employer here. They employ over 1,000 people. Our budget in the village of Buchanan is approximately $6 million. We're looking at losing half of our budget when Entergy closes. When you talk about replacing $3 million, and replacing 1,000 jobs, that's, that's a pretty st steep hill to climb. We're seeing a lot of these nuclear power plants close prematurely in the US and almost everywhere. When they close, they're being replaced by natural gas. That's the first choice for utilities. For Indian Point, they are planning to replace the generation from Indian Point with natural gas, which is a huge loss for the state of New York because New York has a very ambitious climate target to reduce emissions, and Indian Point is about 25% of the electricity for New York City. So taking that offline and replacing it with natural gas, that's a big step backwards if you're concerned about climate and trying to reduce emissions. Indian Point is a built system. There are a lot of assets that have already been invested in Indian Point. It's zero carbon emitting. So if we want to reduce carbon emissions in New York City, then we really don't want to be removing a source of power when it's not emitting carbon. I commend reforming the energy vision as a vision, as an ambitious plan. Indian Point contributes to that vision. To me, it just doesn't seem to really make good economic or environmental sense. It's a premature political decision. Reducing carbon emissions, fighting climate change is a big challenge, and you don't want to take anything off the table. I think we're going to need a lot more wind and solar, for sure, but we're also going to need a lot more nuclear and a lot more natural gas to replace coal. 
You're either a climate change denier or a believer. It's drill, baby, drill, or save the spotted owl. Like most things in life, especially with something as complex as electricity, it just isn't that simple. But here's what we know. There are over three billion people in the world today without adequate access to electricity. In order to empower the low watt world and keep up with the ever increasing power demand from high watt citizens, we're going to need a lot more juice. What's the iron law of climate? So the iron law of climate is based on the idea that th there's really only two ways that we can reduce emissions. One is we could become poorer. The other is that we can use technology through how we source and use energy. The iron law says we're not gonna reduce emissions by willingly getting poorer. Rich people aren't gonna to wanna to get poorer, poor people aren't gonna to wanna to get poorer. If there's one thing that we can count on, it's that policymakers will be rewarded by populations if they make people wealthier. So GDP is going to go up. We're doing everything we can to try to get richer as nations, as communities, as individuals. So if we want to reduce emissions, we really have only one place to go, and that's technology. I think the reason that nuclear is special is that it's the only way to lift everybody out of poverty and solve climate change. People don't appreciate the quantum of difference. We've seen a step up of energy density in the fuels that we've used to date, going from wood to charcoal, coal, oil, gas. And then suddenly you step up two orders of magnitude to uranium. In a piece of uranium the size of a walnut, there's as much potential energy as in the amount of coal to fill a 100-car train. We're not going to get a better battery than that. So here's the only way to make electricity production that contains all of its toxic waste. All of it. I was raised in the environmental school of thought that was telling me the world was getting worse. And then I hit my 30s and started doing my own research and realized, actually, on so many metrics, the world has got better. We're just stuck in an energy paradox, that the energy that's helping us make the world get better has this horrible side effect. Well, let's get rid of the side effect. Let's not get rid of the energy. This idea that there's too many people and that we all have to reduce our energy consumption. The only people in the world who say that are rich people. I, I go around the world, I interview small farmers everywhere, India, Africa, Latin America, Asia. I've never had a small farmer tell me that there's too many people and that we consume too much. Never, you know, um, never had that happen. Whenever we think about electricity, if we think about it at all, we tend to think of it on our own terms. As long as we can flip on the air conditioner, charge our phone, watch TV and surf the web, we take it for granted. Electricity is just there, ever present, invisible, making our high watt lives richer. That's why we hit the road. It's why we traveled over 60,000 miles and interviewed more than 50 people over a three year period. We talked to professors and authors, engineers and activists, and of course, to people who grapple with electricity poverty on a daily basis. Their answers and observations were as varied as their backgrounds but they could, on occasion, find common ground. What does electricity mean? Electricity means prosperity, means good life, means business. What does electricity mean? I feel like it means life. Electricity means opportunity. Electricity is the lifeblood of a modern society. Modern society is hooked on electricity. If we can't keep our hospitals open, our ventilators going, our refrigeration going, it all requires electricity. Electricity means you are a human being. If you don't have food, you can't live. In a modern world, if you don't have electricity, you don't have food. If you don't have electricity, you're cut off from policy making. If you are not plugged in, how will you know? How will you have mobile money? How will you have a bank account? Electricity is like gold to us. Without electricity, we're nowhere. We go backwards, not forward. No human should live on this planet without basic access to electricity. I see electricity as a basic human right. I think people have basic rights. Rights for water, rights for electricity. It should be the universal access. Everybody at the same level. Imagine how much more we can do. Think about the potential of that. When you can marriage dense fuel, particularly electricity, with human ingenuity, we can do nearly anything. As I drove home, I thought about the battles that are waged in the name of electricity in the US and couldn't help but compare them to what I had seen. While we bicker about our favorite electricity sources, billions of people are still stuck in the dark. 
Electricity explains the world because everywhere we went, we saw how the electric grid reflected the society it was powering. In Reykjavik, they smelt aluminum and mined Bitcoin because their electricity is almost free. In Beirut, people endure daily blackouts because the city's grid has been hobbled by endless war and corruption. Electricity, or rather, electricity access, pits two of the toughest challenges of our day against each other, energy poverty versus climate change. There is no easy one-size-fits-all solution. The only certainty is that people will do whatever they have to do to get the electricity they need. The challenge, and it's a daunting one, is this. We have to double global electricity production over the next three decades or so. And we're going to need solar, nuclear, coal, gas, geothermal, wind, and hydro, all of it, to make that happen. Governments aren't going to wait around for academics to resolve their disputes. People around the world are going to demand access to electricity. Can we, the developed industrialized world, help these countries move towards a place of political stability and help them along the road to electrification? We are spending so much of time. How do you provide sanitation? How do you provide, just provide electricity and everything will come. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to start fresh, to look at new ideas, to experiment. I want to be totally sustainable. I want to be off the grid. I want to be able to take charge of my future and my business and not depend on a third person. It's both an opportunity, but also an impending challenge. And it all goes back to electricity. It shouldn't be an either or trade-off. We can't afford to choose electricity over climate change. I mean, the moment we start trying to trade these things off, something has to lose. If people have a choice between either no energy and dirty energy, they will take dirty energy every time. By mid-century, something like 75 to 80 percent of the world's population is going to live in an urban or suburban setting. It's going to be populated by people who really don't want to have to think about their electricity. They want to walk in a room, they want to flip on a light, and they want the light to work, just like us.